So, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me. Very well, um, good, a warm welcome to uh, all the participants here um, for making yourself available to this uh, webinar on our project demonstrating collective impact in the global coffee sector. Uh, we have a quite a diverse range of about 50 participants on the call. And we also have uh, some interesting presenters. Uh, that is Daniele Giovannucci, uh, whom most of you know probably uh, from COSA. We have Jack Lorit, uh, who is from Open Data Services, and myself, I'm Lars Carnot, I'm working for the Global Coffee Platform. So, what's in our, our agenda today? We want to introduce you to a, to a project uh, that we are jointly um, implementing, what the project is about, what we do aim at, and uh, what is the approach, and how do we do it. And most importantly, uh, we want to reach out to you and tell you how you can participate and why you should participate. And after that, we will have a session uh, where you can raise your questions and hopefully we'll get some uh, satisfying answers. And you can also, of course, share, share your comments or further recommendations in that. A few housekeeping rules. Uh, so we will, first of all, run through the presentation and all of you will be muted. Uh, and after that, you can at any time, of course, put your questions into the Q&A box, which uh, you will see on your um, panel. Um, you will be silenced uh, and, and in the Q&A session, you can either continue to put your questions in the Q&A box or you can also raise your hand and ask your questions directly. And please do remember that uh, for archive purposes, this session will be recorded and it will be later on also shared with all the participants. And it will also be shared uh, with uh, some people who could not make it today and who are interested in the results. So starting with a, with a brief overview of the project, it's a project uh, of one year, so it's supported by the ISIL Innovations Fund. It's an, it's an ISIL Innovations Fund small grant. And it's implemented in partnership with uh, UTS joining forces with Rainforest Alliance, as well as Rainforest Alliance joining forces with UTS, and uh, with COSA, and with the valuable support of Open Data Services, who will present uh, there a bit later. Uh, it is, we will follow an open and inclusive approach and that's what brings us here because we want you to contribute, to participate and to co-shape the whole process. So starting with uh, some insights, what brings us to the project uh, is that we are confronted with more and more requirements for data and for reporting. That means that buyers require more evidence of how coffee is produced. Uh, SDG reporting becomes a requirement and different standards ask for different information and often have their own internal requirements. The whole thing is propelled, uh, of course, also by a number of technology innovations that we have seen in the past, like an, on the proliferation of the use of smartphones and different apps. And uh, so if you're a coffee producer and do uh, supply to a range of different customers and maybe on the top of that you also work with different sustainability standards then you might have the challenge that you need to produce a, a lot of different data sets that are often quite similar and might not always be able to be uh, reproduced or re, 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 recycled so to say and uh, there are also a number of reservations and sensitivities with regards to data sharing. So, I mean, I, I today Googled data and oil, for example, as you know, uh, the, the, the saying that uh, data is the new oil, you will find a, a, an equal number of articles stating that either data is the new oil or data is not the new oil. Um, whatever 
whatever you prefer. There are, there are a lot of reservations to sharing data. And of course, especially with regards to sensitive, sensitive data in a competitive environment. And finally, if you aim at exchanging data, really granular information at farm level, it is often difficult to really uniquely identify a farm. Uh, giving a little bit more of a background and uh, of, of the philosophy uh, behind the whole project. So if you look at um, in this uh, uh, graph, if you look at the data flows, there's a really great, great diversity. First of like different questions, the green dots, the uh, different questions or data points asked to that farm level. And many of them are similar, but they're used by different stakeholders. And those different data points and questions, they feed into a variety of different metrics and frameworks, be it uh, company owned frameworks, uh, be it sustainability standards or different reporting initiatives. And finally, we also have like uh, really different technologies that are, that are used and offered by different service providers for um, data collection, processing and storage, which ultimately needs like different uh, end users needs and different reporting requirements. And on top of that, of course, some data are, are accessible and others are really private. So um, the philosophy, the basic philosophy behind our approach is to act, to acknowledge uh, this diversity, but we, we want to try to, to facilitate that a little bit and uh, tap on the potential of, uh, of alignment, uh, of interoperability and, and also of uh, a joint and comparable reporting. That means alignment, uh, that's the first longer uh, arrow, uh, a semantic alignment of indicators and also the data points. Secondly, in interoperability, that means enabling different technologies and uh, databases to exchange data more easily. And finally, to allow for a comparable and possibly joint uh, sector reporting. Uh, having said that, uh, that's a little bit of a repetition. Um, we acknowledge that, of course, different stakeholders use different metrics, use their own technologies, uh, govern their own data, and also have, their, of course, their own sovereignty of their data, which we aim to, to facilitate and align as far as possible um, uh, by following a technology agnostic approach. That means that you can use any with the end product of uh, our project, which I'm gonna uh, present in a minute. Um, you can use any kind of technology uh, that you prefer or yet that you already work with. And of course, respecting individual stakeholders sovereignty over, over their own data. So coming to the project as such, the actual objective, let me let this sink for a minute, is to develop a technical standard for common metrics to facilitate data interoperability and exchange. We will all dive into that in greater detail later on. Um, based on a structured repository of most commonly used indicators. And all those uh, are related and aligned with number one, the ICL Common Core indicators and also the, the SDG indicators. So if you look at, uh, let's say, a standard working flow uh, or a traditional data, sorry, data flow, um, a research, um, I think it's already two years old, and it's often quoted, showed that data scientists spend 60% of their time on cleaning and organizing data. And uh, in total, Collecting data sets comes, comes uh, second at 19% of the time. That means that data scientists spend around 80% of their time on preparing and managing data for analysis. So on top of that, it, it goes on with that, actually 76% of the data scientists view the preparation as the least enjoyable part of their work. So that really sounds like uh, we, need to, we need to pity data scientists, but at the same time, the study also 
uh, says that most of them are really happy with their job. So whatever, wherever you are in the supply chain, and wherever your data comes from, um, everybody, everybody is passing on data, everybody is dealing with data. So it always traditionally means a lot of manual cleaning, packaging, proving, re proofing, re-aggregation, and, and, and yeah, repackaging for different target audiences, be it customers, be it uh, standard organizations, be it uh, maybe the GCP in the future, or be it reporting into uh, sustainable development goals. So our vision is actually that we uh, solve all those problems and uh, uh, develop a data standard together. So a data standard, as you can see here, could come as a converter box that helps to reduce actually this manual cleaning and the preparation of data. So if it's, if it's applied, it could facilitate the data sharing and the reporting to serve different recipients' needs. So if you look to the left, for example, if, you, uh, if your database is this 2.5 inch floppy and you want to submit your data uh, with the endpoint of the USB and you use the universal converter box, it's just one mouse click away. So that's of course uh, not really realistic, but that's a little bit uh, our vision. We won't get there by tomorrow, but that's, that's the, the, the underlying vision of the of the project. So how do we do that? Um, number one, first of all, we need to do, of course, look into it, all the different data points and do a semantic comparison and um, of indicators and also of data points and also how they are measured. So if you look at this slide and we see the, the three different examples of sheets of uh, how data are captured by different parties, um, if you look at the different uh, data points in the second columns, it's relatively simple for some parts to convert, for example, metric tons into kg. So it's just a division by a thousand, but it's, it's, it gets really a little bit more complex and trickier when it comes to other data points. So in this example here, cost of production, um, or where different uh, uh, code lists are used, uh, for example, to, um, uh, to if you work with different currencies or uh, if you work with different farm inputs, and then comparability gets, um, gets really tricky. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the, the first column of the, of the tables, we see the uh, we see the different names. So that would, for example, represent the database names of the different fields. So the different, the, the field, the databases might have different field names. So if you wanted to compare all those things and wanted to consolidate all that, um, and also considering the multitude of stakeholders and the multitudes of different data points out there that are collected for different purposes within different frameworks, it would really be an endless and enormous task. Hence, we need to focus. We need to focus uh, in different ways. So um, the sustainable coffee challenge, uh, led by Conservation International, together with the, with the Global Coffee Platform, uh, have uh, together in a participatory stakeholder process defined uh, common indicators of the sustainability progress framework for coffee. We have uh, discussed for quite a while uh, how to focus and we have basically come across that, okay, we, we should take this as a basis uh, to build on. Um, second, we will focus on impact metrics as opposed to practice-based indicators. So we are not including indicators or data points that ask whether a farmer has received a certain training or not, uh, but we will focus on impact out outcome metrics. Third, 
uh, we will focus um, on metrics that can be measured at farm level. So regardless whether they are reported on aggregate as a percentage of farmers also on, uh, it's, it's farm level, farm level metrics. And this will be uh, complemented by data points uh, to describe the basics of a farm or farm characteristics. There are two different terminologies around that, just like location and size, farm size. Um, and we will also look into different ways of uh, uniquely identifying a farm. So considering that this is a, a small grant, it's a relatively limited time and budget, this will be a start. But uh, we will see to allow for later expansion and, and uh, also uh, look at documenting methodologies that allow for future, future expansion of the standard. So coming to the actual activities, I've touched on, upon some of them already. Um, three major parts are there. So first of all, we are doing a semantic comparison of metrics. This is a work that uh, COSA will do or is doing. And Daniele will, um, after that slide, kindly um, present uh, the COSA approach on that. In a nutshell, um, we're using the, the, the common indicators as a starting point and then conduct one-on-one -on -one discussion and have them operationalized and then uh, with, with you and with interested uh, participants start one-on-one -on -one discussions in how far your data uh, resonates or uh, compares with the, with the proposed set. So the outcome can be that the, uh, the indicators will be uh, extended uh, if, if you consider that, I mean, uh, further indicators need to, need to be included or further data points. Um, and the final result will then be passed over. It will be done in a kind of parallel process um, to open data services. Of course, based on a, on a joint prioritization, we will have a certain uh, points in between where we will consult um, you as stakeholders within, uh, within working groups um, to, to do this prioritization. And um, then open data services will take over. And again, with iterations with uh, stakeholders, do the actual standard development work. And Jack, who is here on the, as a co-presenter, will, will guide us through that as well. And last but not least, uh, the, the, the product, the final result needs to be um, adopted. It needs to be used uh, and it also will need to be further maintained. And um, in order to support that, we will uh, work on a governance model for the standard. We will of course have a documentation platform which is uh, accessible and we will also work on user guidance and adoption support as well as maintenance tools. And uh, with that, I would like to hand over to Daniele on the next slide to uh, walk us through the um, COSA activities, which is the first part of the high level activities I just presented. Thank you, Lars. Uh, good morning or good afternoon and good evening to some of you. It's a pleasure to, to have this discussion with you. Uh, I think that uh, as you can imagine, or if you've seen from, from Lars's, the, the slides that Lars just presented, uh, besides the, uh, the, the humor about this topic, because it is <laughs> a pretty complex one. We, we've been at it uh, as an institution for over 10 years, and, and the process of getting that interoperability is, uh, well, let's just say you have to have a sense of humor about it, because it does it does take quite a bit of effort given the different objectives and the different approaches that many folks have. But what is clear, I think, to almost everyone in the sector now operating in the, in the world of sustainability is that unless we understand each other, unless we can communicate what's actually going on and use that data for good, for the purpose of achieving or driving sustainability, uh, we really, we can't move very quickly. So we're not able to learn if everyone's measuring things in different ways, it's almost impossible 
to understand what best practices are. And it's almost impossible for suppliers and brands, especially, to be able to monitor their supply chains if the supply chain is, is operating at different ways in different parts of the world. And, and we've seen that. We've struggled with, with many clients, and, and I'm sure uh, many of you on the call have the same experience. That's probably why you're here, uh, of, of, the, of, of experiencing having uh, 5, 10, 15 in, in one uh, one, the case of one global corporation, over 45 different supply chains reporting in about 25 or 30 different ways, making it almost impossible for a manager to use the data effectively, right? So this idea, this joint idea uh, supported by ICEAL, but, but very much conducted within the, the framework of the GCP and, and its members and, and its supporters, is to get to these smart metrics, right? Is to, is to have metrics that are specific, measurable, achievable, I, I, we would even say actionable. We have a, a double A, we, we hiccup on our smart, uh, relevant, and of course, time bound. The, the, the reason for that, I think, has been made clear that without accurate indicators, credible indicators, we really can't move forward. But there's also the other point that I think I, I wanted to highlight that, that Lars makes is the issue of cost. Uh, the amount of time researchers spend in the field, the amount of time uh, in data gathering, and how often it isn't very functional, or at least only, uh, it only has a very limited functionality is, is kind of tragic and is one of the things that's holding back a lot of advances in sustainability is the heavy cost of understanding what's going on. So this standardization process will also significantly drive down data cost for almost everyone, including and, and uh, the, the one entity we should never forget, the farmer themselves, who are often uh, spending a fair bit of time, especially the popular ones, uh, giving the same data uh, to five or sometimes even more uh, different uh, different requests. So this idea of getting it operable is is critical. And when we say operable, the end result from our perspective is that managers actually can use the data, that it's coming in in a way that is highly functional for them. They can take decisions from it. They don't have to sit there and and figure it out or spend days, weeks, hours figuring things out. Uh, it also from our perspective, needs to meet one more criteria, and that's that that data needs to be so universal as to be functional coming back into the supply chain, ideally all the way back to the farmer from whom it came, so that every link of that supply chain becomes a, a collaborator, becomes a partner in the process. So we're all aware of the same things in the same way. We can see, people can fine tune and, and uh, refine, or let's call it, uh, in some cases even validate the data, right? But also use it. So we're all using the same data, uh, all taking advantage of it, and we're all, so we're all contributing to sustainability. It's not being driven in a top-down manner or in a way that isn't, isn't obvious to all of the actors that can bring their, their genius and their efforts to this. So, so just a, as a, that brief reiteration of, of Lars's uh, points, hopefully that's uh, from a, just a slightly different perspective. Our purpose in this then, or our objective rather, is to, uh, to not reinvent any wheels. So we really want to start with the good work that's been done. It's been done in a number of frameworks. And so we're, we're not going to look at everything in the world. We don't have the time or budget to do that, but we are certainly starting from the work that's already been done within the GCP, uh, looking at some of the efforts of other platforms, including the SCC, including how the sustainability uh, consortium, how SAI, how, you know, how many different organizations or platforms use data as well, of course, and we work with all of them, so this, is, this should be relatively straightforward. But most importantly, how members of the GCP, how leading organizations are also using these same indicators, including, of course, the, the standards bodies themselves that operate with, with, uh, with data also. So, uh, in essence, looking at a universal space, what is optimal? What are people doing? How can we take the, the, the best common practices out of that and start with a core set of about 10 to 15, uh, which is not to say that we're not looking at many more. We, of course, will, and there will be others developed in time, but beginning with something we can all agree on, the key, the key issues, uh, and taking that, as, as the slide points out, taking that feedback in a structured form so we'll be having a, a key set of back and forth approach 
with some of the key uh, users of data, developers of data uh, currently around the world in, in coffee and uh, working with them to make sure that the feedback or that, that uh, the, their perspectives and how they use data are integrated into the final indicators. Then we want to make sure that we, we keep that simple enough uh, that this doesn't become an academic exercise, right? That we can uh, offer brief guidelines on how data collection should occur in the field, uh, the ways to make sure that there is a, a reasonable level of accuracy because as, as anyone knows with data, garbage in, garbage out, right? So, so it starts with getting the right data from the very beginning. Uh, uh, the a database will not fix uh, terrible data, <laughs> no matter how much we clean the data. Uh, and then finally, the, the guidelines or, or the, destruct, the, the instructions for uh, those structures of data, how to technically represent them so that our colleagues like Jack at ODS and, and others who work in, in the, the technology field can facilitate the use of that data in relational databases so that we can uh, have it available in consistent ways and have it searchable and usable globally so that everyone financial institutions that want to provide credit to a cooperative or uh, a buyer that wants to make sure there's a certain level of compliance or the ICO, the International Coffee Organization, wanting to report on some key sustainability data. All of that should be uh, available eventually, more or less at, at the touch of, uh, of you know, fingers, fingers reach. And so having that quickly and effectively available to everyone is, is of course, the, the interface with, with technology. And that's it in, in a nutshell for our role in, in this process. And uh, we certainly welcome any thoughts or ideas or anyone who has uh, an approach to this that they really want to see represented or some, uh, we're absolutely open to that uh, and we'll accommodate everyone within reason and look forward to, to your input to being, uh, being as, as participatory as we can uh, in that process. Lars? Thank you very much, Daniele. You actually have another have another slide here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you want to go. Through it. Otherwise, uh, so you can just look at that. So the you want to present it? It's just a timeline. It's it's a, a quite simple process. You can see that it's uh, it's rather a bit tight. It's uh, over the course of uh, five months, uh, or actually less, because we'll be reporting it on the last month. So there isn't, uh, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of time to work through everything in the world, as we said, but uh, anyone could, you could see the, uh, the sort of the objectives that we have of getting feedback and having this uh, wrapped up by the end, toward the end of the year. Okay, thank you very much, Daniele. Uh, with that, I would like to directly hand over to Jack uh, to guide us through the second part of the uh, the, tech, the more technical part of the project, which is the, the data standard development. Thanks, Lars. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for having me and for coming along. It's really nice to, to be here. Uh, so what Open Data Services are doing is creating a data standard, which will be using JSON schema. That's probably too much uh, detail. It's not really necessary for you to know that at this stage uh, and that will that will be used for publishing for sharing and maximizing the use of data um, and it's maybe uh, quite useful for me to just address the point that Lars made earlier in the presentation about data as the new oil um, so I think in in our work we quite often think of data as infrastructure that's the kind of metaphor that we go for and I think there's quite a few points where this project hits on infrastructure rather than oil. So we might think of it as identifiers as infrastructure. So we want those to be permanent. We want those to, to never change. We want them to, if there's an identifier, we want to always identify the same farmer every time. Um, and we want them to be permanent. Uh, we can also think of the standard as infrastructure. So if that means that you're submitting uh, the, the same data in the same format, rather than in five different formats to five different uh, people who need the data, that's infrastructure. And we can also think of uh, the tools that enable conversion from one format to another as infrastructure. So that's, I think, probably quite a good way of framing this project as a kind of infrastructural project, rather than the, the, probably the slightly more glamorous oil metaphor that I think uh, is probably quite easy to latch onto. Um, so I think we, we would definitely fall on the data, not the new oil, but it's possibly is the new, the new infrastructure. 
So uh, in, I think in practical terms, the things that we will be doing are listening to the domain experts on this. Um, so thinking about what they have to say, what's important to measure. Uh, so we'll look at what vocabularies are already being used in the sector, uh, what standards are already out there in the sector, whether those are using data or whether those are uh, more qualitative standards. Uh, and we'll also be looking at user needs. So who wants this data and what do they want to use it for? Um, we've already heard from COSA about the process of putting indicators together. And then our job at Open Data Services is to take those indicators and then break them down into a format that a computer can use. So that means making them unambiguous. It means making them documented so that people who are working with computer systems can use them. And it means making them machine readable. So the context for that is, as you probably know, that computers follow instructions. So we need everything to be absolutely clear. Um, and that technical skills often don't overlap with domain skills. So part of our job is to make explicit the uh, implicit knowledge that all of the experts here have in their heads. Uh, so, so our job is to kind of act as the, the translation layer between the experts and the, and the computers. Uh, and I think Lars also talked earlier about the time that uh, data scientists spend cleaning their data. Uh, we can do uh, something about that with the schema as well. So uh, a lot of what the advantages of having a data standard is that we can um, introduce some automatic error checking to what we do. So that might be as simple as saying, if you have a percentage uh, field that has to be between zero and 100, or it might be saying, if you have a codeless value, it has to be one of say 10 string values. Uh, we can also say that if we're working to a standard, people have, there's going to be less replication of analysis work. So people can um, start sharing best practices. Say if we've, we've done this work on our supply chain, you might also be interested in this. If, if everyone's working with different data, that work tends to be one-off analyses. If people are working with a data standard, that, uh, that practice can be shared. And we've seen that with uh, some of the other data standards that we work with. Um, so, and yeah, I think Lars has already touched on this earlier in the presentation, but just to kind of reassure you that we do allow for diversity in information collection and data storage. So it's not that people are gonna to have to unravel the systems that they already have. Um, so this would be an output format and potentially an input format if that's what people wanted, but it's not that people are gonna to have to create a new database to use this, but it is something that could be output to rather than an abrasement for systems that people already have. Uh, and I think the last point to say is that standards are a good way of identifying uh, things that people share across systems. So you could say, I am measuring uh, this part of a farm. If, if you have uh, a list of metrics in front of you, you can say, oh, well, if I was also measuring this aspect of a farm, then I could start looking at this metric as well. So that's an, another reason to look at standards and have them well documented. So I think that's what we're gonna be doing from our side. There's quite a lot of overlap with what COSA are doing because it's a bit of a back and forth process. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have. So I'll hand back to Lars. Thank you very much, Jack. I have actually one slide that falls under your domain. I don't know if you, um, if you want to comment on that, but I just wanted to uh, make uh, maybe a data standard somewhat a little bit more tangible. <laughs> yes, so this is, this is like a little fragment of JSON. So this is what a, I'm just trying to work out what this actually represents. So I think this is. That was, that was a, first, a first start here. It's just an example. We yeah, so, so this I think breaks down a particular calculation. So it represents a uh, nominator uh, numerator and would give you code lists, uh, geographic parts of it. And I, so I think this, but this is basically what the computer would read. Uh, if you were an analyst working in another field, you might want to convert this into a flat format in the spreadsheet. 
and there would be tooling to do that. Uh, so, so this is like the JSON half of the of the exercise. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, it also needs to be mentioned that this is actually adding on a work that has already been done been done by Uts in another uh, ICL Innovations Fund grant, uh, who have done a framework for digitalized frame data. That is how to present uh, uh, farms and plots and former groups uh, in this uh, JSON format or have standardized that and this project would feed into that uh, into that framework that that has been already prepared by by Woods. Now coming quickly to certain standard usage usage options how how the standard uh, can can be used in, in different ways or where it can be applied just really in a schematic way. So, I mean, you can, of course, apply it already at, during data collection. You can apply it directly in your technology. Uh, you can um, implement APIs or use it for all kinds of data exchange in, in different directions uh, to yeah, to exchange the data and use uh, different filters uh, to allow your system to talk to others, be it to uh, customers, be it, be it for public reporting and to SDGs or wherever, and uh, also into different uh, standard systems. Now, last but not least, uh, as I mentioned uh, already, um, the, third, the third part of the activity is the standards usage uh, facilitation. So a, a standard is, of course, uh, um, a, living, a living animal. Um, the project will not be concluded, or the work will not be concluded with the end of the project. Uh, so we will need to have a lean governance uh, and governance model for the standard. As I said, it needs to be documented. There will be an online documentation platform, um, self-guidance tools. Uh, we will have standard adoption, and we will also work a little bit on the um, encouraging different stakeholders to use the standard and also to exchange data a little bit more through uh, showcasing su success story and also uh, providing success best practices and success stories of value data of, of data sharing and and collective reporting now maybe to repeat uh, in a in a nutshell what is in for you for all kinds of uh, different stakeholders dealing with coffee and dealing with data in coffee be it producers or be it uh, uh, traders or be it roasters uh, or be it also financial institutions. Um, so the, the project or the output of the project, the data standard will considerably help to streamline actually data production at the production level. Uh, it will considerably reduce data transaction cost uh, as also Jack um, outlined. It will enable a, a, a more comparable reporting um, in the end, and uh, haven't really highlighted that uh, sufficiently as yet. It is also one of the intentions to include uh, data points and indicators that are required by financial institutions to inform lending decisions in this process and in this standardization process, which ultimately will lead to maybe an approved, improved access to finance for producers, even through this inclusion of indicators that are relevant for finance. Now, coming to you and to all stakeholders out there, we cannot conclude, we need to um, work with you throughout the project. And we need you to get involved and to participate in that. Uh, and you can do that in various ways, whether you are any supply chain member from producers to roasters and retailers, 
whether you are a sustainability standard, whether you work for a financial institution or are working with coffee farmers as an implementer or an NGO, or whether you're a technology provider or a in, in, involved in the subject in any other way. So if you are uh, a supply chain member, if you have your own data set or your, sorry, your own data uh, framework that you're collecting data with, uh, we would strongly encourage you and uh, to take an interview with COSA and align your data sets or give input into the, the, the common indicators and, the, and the, uh, the, the data points that will have been curated by COSA um, to provide your input into that and uh, how, how your data, uh, the data you collect relate to this uh, proposed list. Optionally, you can also, you're most welcome to also, if you want, share the actual indicators you collect. Uh, for some, this in itself might already be sensitive data, but you're also most welcome to share your indicators and your data points you collect for reference. Um, then we will, we will have uh, at certain points uh, in, the, in, the, in the project, uh, we will, of course, uh, co-validate the data points and um, reach out to you to uh, to have a kind of governance for the for the for the project itself, um, to endorse the results and discuss the results at several points in time, and this includes um, both the actual indicator and data point list. But then also, and that, that goes more to the, to the more technical people to co-validate and to do some iterations on the, on the data standard. So the more technical part of it. Uh, finally, you're most welcome that let's a little bit further down the road, if you volunteer to, uh, to conduct a pilot, which could all either be uh, provide some of your data to uh, valid, to run through the standard and, and um, uh, validate it, uh, test it, so to say, or we could also think of a, of a, of a more concrete direct field level test with a, with a concrete group of, uh, of farmers. And then last but not least, uh, you still have the possibility ultimately to pioneer the standard adoption. If you want to do so, you're most welcome to register under this link. You don't need to note it down. Um, I think we can share it through the chat and we will of course also share it along with the documentation uh, later on in the email. Uh, it leads you to a very simple form where you can indicate what your interests are and to which level you want to participate or uh, share some share some further questions or recommendations. Finally, just coming in addition to what uh, Daniele already mentioned, coming to some very high level timelines. So today we have the the outreach webinar to you to external stakeholders. Uh, during August, uh, hopefully, we will be able to provide through COSA feedback, you will be able to provide feedback on indicators and the data points. Um, we will have certain feedback loops on the, on the semantic comparison results, uh, on the technical data standard, and produce uh, some of the outputs later on. And the project actually ends by officially by the end of February, where we hope to have um, at least one or two pilots conducted. And with that, we have reached the end of our presentation quite well in time. So we still have 15 minutes left uh, to open the floor to you um, to share your questions, uh, either via the chat box or if you raise your hand, you can also voice them orally.
Thank you. Lars, I'm happy to uh, take them on. They're both uh, relevant, if you like. One's one we've answered already via text, but uh, I need to I need to open my chat box first. I haven't seen them yet. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. Sure. Well, I think that Hank made a very good point about is this going to be continuously yes. difficult as we work with other uh, indicators of band in the future. And of course, it will be easier having uh, figured out a who's got different approaches, uh, looking at some standardization of approach, but the process itself of, of hearing what uh, practices are, determining optimal points, uh, agreeing on a definition, on the architecture for that definition, if you will, in, in the data, et cetera, and testing all of that to make sure that it works consistently across databases, relational databases, uh, will still take a fair bit of time in the future, so it isn't uh, an, 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 as easy as just flipping a switch, but it will be continuously easier. And, and using JSON and, and our own relational database, uh, we, we've experienced the same, the same challenge. It takes a bit of time to really get it to be just perfect so that when you're querying for a particular piece of data, you can be, uh, it's quite reliable and consistent. So that was uh, to Hank's point. Um, and, uh, Hopefully that answers it. And Hank, feel free to uh, to give us more if you'd, if you'd like more clarity on the uh, on the question. And, and maybe uh, Jack, did you have any thoughts about that as well, or is it, does that align with your? Um, yeah, I think just to add on to that, certainly from our side, once the kind of structure of the data standard is down, things will be significantly easier. The mm -hmm. one kind of complication would be is if we see um, metrics that take on a significantly different shape. So Lars mentioned towards the end that we might see financial metrics. And I know from experience with other standards that financial metrics can be extremely complex. So that might be something where we need to do um, more kind of engineering on the standard side and we see uh, a longer time frame to in introduce those to the standard. Right, good point, good point. Um, and then uh, Miyako's uh, question also I think is a, is a very good one. Uh, when we refer, she, she asks, uh, when we refer to farm level data, do we mean cooperative level or individual farmer level? And I, obviously she has experience of how challenging it can be to get actually to a farmer. Uh, and we have a lot of experience with cooperatives not able to get uh, much of the farmer level data, right? Especially weaker ones. So that is a challenge. The optimal is of course, understanding the farmer level. Uh, but ultimately, the idea is to really get to the point of understanding the entire supply chain. We're, we're beginning with the black box, uh, the, the core, if you will, and, and the, perhaps the least understood of the places where we get data, right? Because there is very little consistent data coming from the field. So the optimal is at the farmer level. In some cases, the, the proxies will, will have to exist uh, at a cooperative level initially that they get that data, but ultimately both should be available in order to have optimal transparency. And, and I think a lot of cooperatives agree that they're looking for the support as well uh, to look at how to understand that data and how to get it. And we work with quite a few in different countries and it is a challenge for them, but those that do it well are extraordinary. They're, they're very successful at providing services and uh, both to their clients and of course to their members. So that answers that question. Uh, I don't know if Lars or, or Jack care to add anything to that. Uh, I, I would just add that there is no barrier to us attaching multiple identifiers to a single thing that we are measuring. So if in the initial stages we can only attach a cooperative identifier, that's fine. And then we can hopefully kind of push people towards best practice and then also attach an individual identifier later. But we'd always have the ability to distinguish between the, the identifier schemes that we are talking about. Right. Uh, should we keep going, Lars? Is that all right? I see there's a real who's who of coffee experts here. We have Paul Stewart and John Schluter. They, uh, <laughs> nothing will get by these two guys. Uh, so, uh, Paul, a great question, of course. I, I, I think ultimately it, it will go more and more toward a standardization process so that we know, you know when we're comparing A with B, so different countries, cost of production, uh, those kinds of things so that we know exactly what the what we're looking at but initially i think the purpose isn't to put handcuffs on data 
it's to make it more more functional and so rather than defining a standard methodology it would be more like uh, the, the the suggested guidelines for how to do that optimally uh it, it you know it's not going to be quite perfect for everyone but ultimately yeah uh, it's like anything else in the financial field you know you know where to put the decimal point if you make a mistake of one decimal point it it, it does make a big difference right so standardization is is critical and we want to move toward that I don't think we'll go immediately into a you know an absolute defined you can only gather it this way and only at this time of year, but uh, rather have pretty good guidelines for a process. Um, and again, uh, Jack or, or or Lars, please feel free to to uh, jump in on on that uh, approach. That's for a collection of data from the field we're talking about. If you have any thoughts, otherwise we'll jump. Well, in. yeah, I think I. I I think uh, we are, we are not um, we are we are not talking about a methodology, but we are talking about um, the actual concrete definition of a data point. I don't really know what you what you exactly mean by methodology, but I think it's it's more yeah it's really more on a technical level um, that we are that we are aiming at. Right. So the definition of that's a good distinction. The definition of the indicator has to be clear unambiguous and very specific. That's, uh, that's very obvious, right? Uh, how you collect it, from whom, at what time of year, the level of frequency, the level of, uh, of atomization, if you will, those details are, have a little bit more play uh, in order to accommodate the realities. We're, we're trying to make this a pragmatic process so that everyone could get in and start getting involved and and not trying to make it perfect uh so that only one or two could could really accommodate that so uh, ultimately i think that's the the overall goal uh to balance those two objectives uh all yeah. right yeah uh john uh the are farmers behind it well interestingly i think that many are we, we see farmer representatives in two forms as cooperatives, in some cases, individual farmers, often larger, uh, and other farmer groups like the, the Federation and others who are very keen in, in Colombia, who are very keen on having an understanding of what's actually going on and being able to convey that. Uh, people still contest what the actual cost of production is. You know, why can't I pay only 90 cents uh, for a pound of coffee? if we think that people maybe are producing it for 75. So, you know, these questions are still remain, right? And, and some of them are very fundamental. Uh, I think that uh, increasingly governments too are interested in having the data more and more available for at least at the, at the, at the general level because of most of the commitments to the SDGs, for example. But your point is well taken and some have laws actually prohibiting the use of, of, of data generally, the specific data of individual farmers. The idea here is not to go to that level of, of detail. All of this data would of course be presented in a safe and scrubbed manner as averages for a region uh, that it would never be a farmer X somewhere, right? So, so that is, we avoid some of the, of the challenge of that, which is, which is vital. And I think the need, at least our, our, our full commitment, and I believe the commitment of the GCP as well, is to fully integrate any government or any official entity into the process to hear their voice and to be able to make data available to them as well. Hence the commitment to having uh, the alignment, for example, with UN approaches like the SDGs uh, and many others, literally several dozen different um, uh, approaches that we're taking into account to make sure that we're standardized across the board. Uh, Lars, did you have any uh, comment on that first A yeah, part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's a tricky question, of course. Um, so bluntly, bluntly uh, answering on A, um, no, not yet. But uh, so this this is the first time we are reaching out, and I think we need to be reminded of the fact that we are. I mean, as Jack put it. Uh, we, are, we are providing with the data standard, we are providing the inter infrastructure. And of course, there's uh, rightfully so to a certain degree, a reluctance of uh, to share data on different levels for different parties. Uh, when it comes to sensitive data, when it comes to exploitation of, of data for whatever purposes, um, we, are, we are providing the infrastructure and also 
have an, a component that it goes a little bit into awareness raising and showing the benefits, but also maybe the, the, the risks of, of data sharing for, for individual uh, stakeholders. Um, so, but in a nutshell, I would say it's, it's not actually the, the, the intention or the purpose of this, this project to, uh, to, to actually share data, but it's, it's about providing the infrastructure as, as Jack put it. Yeah, and I think a question B is is very much to that point. It'd be part of John's uh, question about the the specifics of what would you actually do with the data, and and I think that's critical. The the intention I think to to resume or to pick up what Lars said uh, is in no way to expose any individual or even uh, a cooperative's or group's data in any way. It's to enable them to whoever wants to measure it, and there's no, and there's no obligation here, right? Uh, but someone who wants to measure, and I think that's the key, that they would know how to do it uh, so that they can benchmark. And I think we're increasingly seeing, we, we just finished a piece of work with cooperatives in Kenya, for example, where they were thrilled to get the data back to actually see how they were benchmarking uh, with each other. So they had their own data, of course, and the data in aggregate for the region and, and it was very useful for them to understand what could be done or how they might improve or where they were behind in certain areas or where they were ahead and just, just useful for them. So ultimately that could be a use of the data but initially uh, the, I think the output isn't, isn't any of the intention here. It's not let's get this data back although once it is systematized one could see that benefit for them in, in the future and, and again just to be clear, there's no obligation here. There's no, there's no uh, legal. There's certainly we're not looking for you know, to implement a, a strong policy or anything that would create a, a challenge for farmers. I think we, you're you're quite right to point out that anything that would be detrimental to a farmer, we should we should take very 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 seriously. And so thank you for your your comments and your wisdom on that. Yes, to your next point. I hope everyone can see there's a, there is a uh, Q&A uh, folder on your screen that you can click on to see these in writing if you like. Thanks, John. Yeah, that's very, yeah, it's a very valid comment. Yeah. Are there any further questions or comments? And thanks a lot for your encouragement, Justin, as well. Sorry, I think I was muted. Are there any further questions or the hey, presentation? Uh, the yeah. presentation will be made available uh, along with the recording as well. Yeah, and we will also share again the link for uh, the registration for the for the participation within the project. Uh, I think James raised his hand for a question. Uh, uh, James, do you want to type it in or? Can you can we unmute him to quickly speak it? Do we have, uh, or I think, I don't know if we're out of time, Lars. You you, you have to decide. So last question, and yeah. then we make it really in time. Cool. I think James, you you must be unmuted. Thanks, Amy. Another webinar in a month or so, uh, probably a month and a half or, yeah. Yes, we will, John, thanks. And uh, James, if we don't get to your question, if you're not able to unmute, uh, please feel free to reach out and we'd be very happy to, you, you have my email. <laughs> so we can have a conversation or send it, of course, to Lars if you prefer, either way, or we can have a call, okay? That was an accidental hand raise. Have oh, you're there now. Uh, you're there. Thanks, hello. I, there was no question, accidental hand raise. Have a great day. Oh, afternoon. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It was a so salute. That, uh, High five. Thank you very much for your interest and making yourself available and your uh, um, questions and your recommendations and your encouragement. And you will hear from us. We will share the presentation along with the recording and the documentation and further instructions as a summary of this webinar. Thank you very much. Great.
and uh, talk to you soon, hopefully. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. Jack, ciao. Thanks.